Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to start in a second. Uh, before we, uh, we start, I would like to thank all of you for successfully braving the storm last night to talk about quantum science. Uh, and we're so happy to have so many researchers uh, from Yale alumni to people in the field and also new generation of students and researcher. And so it's really, really exciting to have all of you here on site. And now we can, we can start and we're gonna uh, have uh, Michael Cray, the Vice Provost for Research and the William Zingler Professor of Neuroscience and Ophthalmology and Visual Science kick off the conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Warren. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I will be very brief and begin uh, actually to reiterate uh, Florian's thanks to everybody who's come to Yale from all over the country and all over the world. It's a tremendous tribute to uh, quantum science at Yale and to Rob and Steve and Michelle, uh, the influence they've had on quantum uh, physics and quantum engineering over the course of the last 20 plus years. So thank you for coming. Um, we hope that you will learn a lot and that you will come to appreciate not only um, the quality of the science, in quantum science that's happened here at Yale over the last 20 years, but the future prospects for quantum science, which I think are tremendous. So thank you for coming, and I look forward to the program. Um, so <clears throat> I want to uh, next pause and just remark on, um, I, I expect this conference to be extremely smooth and uh, easy to follow and quite efficient in its uh, processes. And for that, we have to thank Florian and the Yale Conference and Events teams. He's put in a lot of effort, as well as the other folks in, in the Yale Quantum Institute. And I want to make sure, whenever you have a chance, please acknowledge his effort and uh, the quality of support he is, and the, actually the thoughtfulness for the for what I think is going to be just a tremendous, uh, tremendous conference. So thank you, Florian and team. Uh, I, just an, another minute or two. Um, Yale is, uh, well, so those of you who haven't been back to Yale for a little while, you may not recognize the building you're in. That's because it's a new building. In this spot was a building that was called the Gibbs Building. It was not a very high quality a science building. It was torn down, and this uh, new Yale Science Building was built in its place. It's a tremendous uh, modern facility for uh, biological sciences. Uh, the Department of Molecular Cellular and Developmental Biology is principally housed in this building. In addition to this new building, the Klein Tower, which some of you might recognize as the old Klein Biology Tower, was completely gut renovated, and inside of it is a beautiful conference facility on the 14th floor. And actually, uh, dinner tonight will be in that conference facility on the 14th floor. It's got a beautiful beautiful view of uh, New Haven, a 360 degree view. The rest of that building is now housed by the Department of, uh, let's see, Statistics and Data Science, uh, Mathematics, uh, Astronomy, and some uh, Physics faculty as well. So it's a computational dry lab building. It's no longer a wet lab building, but the, um, the sort of co-location of those uh, departments uh, with the new Institute for the Foundations of Data Science, I think, puts a nice focus on the role and the import of data science, broadly speaking, computational science in general, in the future of science at Yale. So besides those important building projects which have occurred just over the last couple years here at Yale, I want to just note that quantum science is a major focus of growth for the university. It was identified about five years ago in a comprehensive strategic plan by our provost, Scott Strobel, and many of the Yale folks here participated in, in the development of that uh, strategic plan. But quantum science and engineering in particular was identified as an area of future growth, such that we have now broken ground on a new physical sciences and engineering engineering building complex just to the north of here. So it's the north part of northwest block, part of this uh, block of campus. Um, it's a very comprehensive project that will juxtapose and in part surround the Wright Lab, which some of you visited yesterday. Uh, and, and in fact, the shovel's in the ground right now for a new a chemical safety building, which we have to build in order to prepare the site for the physical sciences and engineering building. This will be a 300,000 square foot plus facility for more than 40 faculty, uh, essentially doubling the faculty in physical sciences and engineering at Yale. It includes a 12,000 square foot clean room, modern clean room on bedrock, a large materials characterization core facility, a large imaging core facility, and an advanced instrumentation and development center, which will all facilitate quantum science, quantum engineering, and materials science. So those of you who 
um, uh, have never been to Yale before. Uh, the Yale has changed dramatically in the last few years, and you can expect pretty dramatic changes in the over the course of the next uh, five to 10 years, including huge investments in quantum science and engineering, largely because of the tradition that was established by Michelle and Steve and uh, um, Rob. And so I, I want to just uh, pause here and um, note the amazing science that they've done over the last 20 plus years and the amazing um, science that they, they spawned in the context of all of you here. Many of you were our children or grandchildren of Michelle, Rob, and Steve. And a new field of science, really, quantum computing, I think has emerged as a result of their uh, seminal contributions. So it's amazing work. It's wonderful to be able to uh, pause for a minute, look back over the course of the last 20 years what they've accomplished, and also think together about what we might accomplish over the course of the next 10, 20 years, which I think has, is essentially limitless. So thank you to you. And um, I'm really looking forward to the conference. And, for, and so now I'd just like to, actually one more, one more final comment. So tonight at dinner, those of you who can make dinner, there will be a model and some posters, poster boards, about the new physical sciences and engineering building complex up on the 14th floor. You can look down on the site where that building will be built. And tomorrow and Friday, that model and posters will be in the, um, in the uh, entry area to Marsh, so you can uh, look, look at it and see what it is that we're planning, which I think is quite spectacular. Okay, so now pivot to the science, which I'm sure which is uh, what you're all interested in uh, learning about. So I'm going to introduce uh, Steve Gervin. Uh, Steve is a U uh, Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. He's also the former Vice Provost uh, for uh, Science, uh, the position I'm uh, fortunate to hold right now, Vice Provost for Research. Um, Steve has made seminal contributions in quantum science, including most of the theoretical concepts that underlie the uh, engineering that, uh, that you'll hear more about uh, over the course of the, of the next three years, uh, three days. So Steve, um, welcome and uh, thank you for providing the introductory uh, talk for, this, uh, for the conference today. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, we appreciate uh, you being here to introduce the conference and also for uh, the financial support that the provost office uh, provided through the Flint Fund. So, uh, so this is the start of what we hope is an exciting uh, conference. And uh, let me start by uh, pointing out that uh, we're in the centennial uh, period of the invention of quantum mechanics. What exact year you think is the 100th anniversary depends on whether you're uh, French, German, or Austrian. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, 100 years to the week that uh, Werner Heisenberg was on the island of Helgoland inventing matrix mechanics, there'll be a nice conference there. So I commend that to you. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, kind of uh, the brief history of circuit QED and then talk about <clears throat> uh, some uh, new results that we've been uh, 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 working on with uh, uh, our many collaborators here in YQI. So um, I want to give a special thanks to the ARO for uh, their strong support of this burgeoning field over the last quarter century. And it's been very important to the history that I'm going to uh, tell you about now. And uh, a lot of you know, the senior people will know the history, and, uh, but some of the younger people don't know all of the, the things shrouded in the mists of time. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to go over that a bit. And uh, the field started with uh, classical mechanics and the realization that the Josephson uh, equations told us that the phase across a superconducting junction obeyed Newton's classical law of motion, uh, you could think of the phase as the position of a particle. And uh, it sits in a, in a washboard potential if you have a current bias junction. And if it escapes from one of the wells, it begins falling downhill. And because the um, uh, velocity of the particle, the time rate of change of the phase, uh, is the voltage, you can detect that uh, velocity. 
And uh, for you young people who don't know what a washboard is, Mike Tinkham always used to say, it's a um, classical analog of a Josen junction. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so people started building these circuits and doing interesting things with them uh, in a world dominated by friction. And Tony Leggett began asking questions about Schrodinger cats and, and you know, if this particle, if this uh, variable acts like the position of a particle, could that particle exhibit macroscopic quantum behavior? And uh, so uh, our heroes, uh, John Clark and Michelle uh, Devere and, <coughs> and John Martinez in 1985 decided to see if that particle um, had quantized energy levels inside these little potential wells. And they did that by uh, uh, spectroscopy, by uh, <coughs> kind of quantum jump spectroscopy where you shine microwaves at the right transition frequency and then the particle is high enough up in the well that it can tunnel out into a finite voltage state. So it's microwaves in and low frequency voltage measurements out. And sure enough, uh, they saw peaks in the spectrum indicating that this particle could be quantum mechanical. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, people started playing with Cooper pair boxes and uh, it's just a, a capacitor with a, a, a bias voltage on it and it's a sufficiently small capacitor that tuning this voltage could um, um, uh, change the average uh, number of Cooper pairs from n to n plus one, from a billion to a billion plus one. And if you choose the bias voltage correctly, those two states can be degenerate, and because of the coherent Josephson tunneling, you can go into a superposition of those two charge states, and so unlike uh, a normal junction, the average charge would change over a voltage range that was controlled by the coherent tunneling amplitude, the coherent tunneling splitting between those two charge states. Uh, also in Japan, uh, uh, Yasu Nakamura was working on this and he was doing uh, microwave measurements, again doing spectroscopy to see this uh, splitting and then had a, um, a uh, destructive readout that involved a complicated process in which various voltages were tuned in such a way that a Cooper pair could break and tunnel out, acquiring some uh, energy to break from the bias voltages and, and create a tiny uh, tunneling current in the circuit. So again, uh, microwaves in and a, a quite difficult noisy low frequency measurements to see what happened. But then in uh, uh, 1999, Yasu wrote the paper which got me into the field. I'd never heard of the concept of quantum computing. I didn't know there were crazy people thinking about <laughs> this possibility. <laughs> and he did this amazing experiment where he, uh, with a uh, half a million dollar uh, picosecond pulse generator, moved the bias point of the circuit to the degeneracy point so fast that the system was then in a coherent superposition of the two eigenstates and it's the real time, you know, it's the time domain uh, analog of Rabi oscillations in a, in a driven atom. And here you can see these uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, Rabi oscillations, but look at the time scale, it's picoseconds. And, um, uh, but still, it was the, the first time that this sort of real-time quantum dynamics had been seen due to this coherent splitting. <clears throat> then, uh, and this is a, you know, I don't have time to do the whole history, so I'm just picking out a few highlights. So this is uh, Quantronium from the Sacle group, and uh, it was an artificial atom tuned to a clock transition to a place where the splitting frequency is first order insensitive to um, the control knobs that you can turn, uh, some uh, magnetic flux and some bias voltage. And if you, you know, a fundamental theorem 
of engineering is that if you can turn a knob, the noise demon can also turn that knob. So you uh, want to be at a place where you're first order sensitive, insensitive to, the, to those effects. And this was, I remember Rob and I discussing this thing uh, <laughs> just seemed to ring forever, you know, half a microsecond. It was incredible <laughs> how, how long the, the coherence was. And this was the first observation of Ramsey fringes in a solid state qubit. And why was this important? Because it's the thing we needed to convince those pesky AMO physicists that this was the real deal. <laughs> Okay, this is their acid test for uh, coherence. So that was uh, incredibly exciting, and the, and the experiment was done just before uh, Michelle uh, moved to Yale and really, um, really uh, moved things forward. Uh, Hans Moy in Delft, um, uh, and uh, also in uh, some experiments in collaboration with Yasu, um, uh, developed a kind of dual to these uh, charge-based qubits, the flux qubit. And um, John Martinez uh, developed a high fidelity readout. It was 85%. It was like amazing uh, high fidelity for those days. And it, it was going back to his PhD thesis. Here you had two levels that were deep enough in the well that they could be your qubit. You could have a Robbie drive. But then if you wanted to read it out, you could check whether it was in this state by exciting it to this state and then having it tunnel out and uh, release a flood of energy as the particle fell down the hill. And that flood of energy was big enough that he got this amazingly high readout fidelity for the time, 85%. But unfortunately, when uh, you tried to do this with two qubits, that amazing flood of energy wiped out the other qubit. So in the end, it, wasn't, uh, uh, it was too destructive. But it was, a, it was a, a, uh, a real advance in terms of readout fidelity. Uh, then uh, coming back to New Haven, uh, with a couple of people who are here in the room, uh, the transmon qubit, sort of the world's simplest thing, just uh, a little uh, dipole antenna with the two halves connected by a Josen junction. It's not so little for an atom, it's a millimeter across. The, um, the transition dipole moment is several Cooper pairs moving a millimeter, which is a lot bigger than the transition dipole moment of, uh, of sodium, for example. And uh, it had this wonderful feature that it was exponentially insensitive to offset charge noise. And I, you know, uh, people that didn't experience those early days won't understand why I had PTSD looking at those old slides about, uh, uh, <laughs> that involved charge. So uh, there's just stuff in the substrate that moves around and uh, we can't fix that, but we can make a qubit that's insensitive to that. It's an artificial atom with atomic number 10 to the 12, and yet the spectrum is simpler than that of hydrogen, and it has a, a comparable quality factor. Uh, nowadays, people, many people are making high fidelity gates. Here's one example from Will Oliver's group, or two examples, a controlled phase gate uh, through a coupler between two transmons, and uh, even uh, higher fidelity gates between two uh, uh, fluxonium qubits with a transmon coupler. So, it's just been tremendous progress. You'll hear more from other people during the week, and in Rob's uh, dual rail talk on Friday, I think you'll also see some uh, uh, amazing fidelity numbers. Uh, and you know, a key part of the um, the engineering is that uh, you need quantum limited amplifiers to detect the very tiny signals that uh, uh, came out of come out of these systems. And there are many people, many of whom are in the audience, uh, who contributed to this. Uh, Conrad is, is, um, is using them now to search for dark matter uh, axions with our colleagues in, in the Wright Lab uh, here at Yale. And uh, Michelle and Zlatko used the very high efficiency measurements to, to catch and even reverse a quantum jump in mid-flight. So really, uh, very important engineering uh, developments. 
Okay, so now <clears throat> on to really uh, circuit QED. So we know that um, QED is um, really the study of the effect of vacuum fluctuations, so the quantization of the electromagnetic field in, in the world, and it has many uh, effects that you learn about, not at the beginning of your quantum mechanics course, but certainly in graduate school. It leads to spontaneous emission of the first excited state of hydrogen in 1.5 nanoseconds. It renormalizes the mass of the electron, gives a splitting um, um, between the, the lamp shift, between the nominally degenerate states of the hydrogen atom. And we, uh, the engineering we're trying to do uh, is to change the spectrum of the vacuum fluctuations by putting them between mirrors or even inside a superconducting box if it's microwaves. And uh, by changing that spectrum, you can engineer new properties. And in particular, uh, you can have the Purcell effect to suppress the spontaneous emission of the artificial atom uh, uh, by not having any modes in the cavity uh, at that frequency. That doesn't work in macroscopic optical uh, systems because it can still radiate this way. But inside a box, if you take a transmon in free space, it has a spontaneous emission lifetime of 100 nanoseconds. It can be a thousand times or more longer inside one of these boxes. So that's very important. Uh, so here's the original gang uh, uh, with the first experiment. It's inside a uh, shielded copper box uh, because we were sure that all those cell phones that were being invented in those days uh, were going to screw up the experiment. Turns out they didn't. Um, but it was electromagnetically quiet, so quiet inside there that Dave Schuster could sleep standing up. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so what we did in, in, in this uh, paper, uh, led by Alexander Black, uh, a theory paper, was to get rid of all the DC stuff and send in microwaves in and get microwaves out. And I didn't understand, you know, as a condensed matter physicist, I didn't know anything about quantum measurements in those days. I had to learn this. And this really is sort of the prototypical quantum measurement. You send in the microwaves, they come back with a phase shift that depends on the frequency of the cavity, which in turn depends on the state of the qubit. And so you literally entangle the qubit with a meter, the, the photons, and then you read out the meter. And uh, I learned so much uh, from finally un understanding quantum measurements uh, from thinking about this. It was a really wonderful time. Uh, so uh, uh, Andreas and Dave uh, managed to get the vacuum Rabi splitting uh, for the first time in the circuit. And I remember when <laughs> trying to calculate how big was it going to be and you know, get the units right and everything. And uh, it came out 100 megahertz. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's pretty gigantic. But then you know, there was charge noise, and it was horrible. But they managed, to, uh, they managed to get at work sneaking in at night when things were the elevator wasn't running or something. <laughs> and, um, and that worked. And that illustrated strong coupling, that the, the coupling, the dipole coupling was bigger than the dissipation. Then uh, Dave and Jay went into the limit where the second order effects of the coupling, the dispersive coupling, were still so big, they were bigger than the dissipation. And then you could count individual microwave photons proving that uh, they really are particles, not waves. And, uh, and um, also could see this uh, Purcell suppression. Uh, Honey Pike did a 3D cavity experiment, and Matt Ragor uh, worked on making these cavities uh, much longer lived, and now we have new designs, and, and uh, the, the, uh, it's amazing now uh, the lifetimes you can get um, uh, out of these things. Um, so the Santa Barbara group um, uh, uh, started making superpositions of small numbers of photons. Here's the theoretical Wigner function and the experimental reconstructed Wigner function for 0 plus 1 through 0 plus 5. 
uh, from our friends here. And uh, so we're, you know, and, and uh, Rob and company did an experiment uh, seeing the electric field between a superposition of zero and one photons. And uh, we were really into the world of controlling individual quanta. And then uh, this first uh, two qubit uh, quantum processor with the two qubits talking to each other through the quantum bus, a virtual exchange of microwave photons that was developed uh, in, in Rob's lab uh, uh, by these guys. And we were so excited to you know, run a quantum algorithm <laughs> with two qubits. And uh, OK, it's a start. You have to start somewhere. And uh, I think Jerry uh, will tell us uh, about some minor scaling up that they've been doing <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the last few years. Uh, and uh, that's, we look forward to hearing that. Uh, it's going to be exciting. So here's the gang excited about uh, two qubit entanglement and, uh, and algorithms in uh, 2007. And uh, uh, Dave doesn't look that excited, but uh, <laughs> I, I, think he, I think he was happy. I don't know. <laughs> OK, so, um, so I'm going to, uh, that's the past. I want to talk about um, more recent past of quantum error correction. And I'm just going to briefly mention things uh, uh, with three different experiments using bosonic codes, which have gotten to uh, slightly beyond uh, break even. <laughs> and more recently, substantially beyond. And then I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, on the theory end later. So, um, so uh, the first code uh, was the CAT code that was um, uh, developed by our, uh, with, in collaboration with theory collaborators and uh, experiment in Rob's lab from uh, in 2016, uh, uh, getting slightly uh, above break even using Schrodinger cat states with the either superposition of two positions or two momenta. And then uh, Lu Yan Sun, who, an alum from here, uh, did a nice exp two nice experiments using the binomial code, which Liang Zhang and I uh, uh, threw together as a summer project with an undergraduate, uh, Marius Michael and uh, uh, got uh, just above break-even um, in the conser correct, conservatively defined way. Um, in uh, uh, 2023, and uh, in the same issue of Nature, uh, Vlad Sivak and Michelle's uh, group uh, uh, did a quantum error correction using these beautiful uh, grid states, GKP, uh, code words, and there was uh, um, an improved uh, tantalum transmon, a, um, a reinforcement learning agent that helped improve this, and on the theory side, um, a nice uh, new semi-autonomous stabilization protocol that avoided the measurement and feedback uh, scheme, uh, and all of those things combined to get us up to an error correction gain of, of 2.3. And really impressively, uh, you could do 400 cycles of quantum error correction uh, uh, before losing the information. So that's really in a class by itself. OK, so now I want to turn to the future and tell you about a few things that are in this monster paper that I've been saying for some time is almost ready. Uh, it's 12 authors, 137 pages, 533 references, and we're still working on it. Uh, and it's to try to formalize, in a computer science sense, some of the instruction set architectures that experimentalists now are using to control uh, hybrid systems consisting of discrete variable qubits and continuous variable oscillators. And this is uh, primarily a C2QA project, but uh, the Yale part is also um, supported by ARO. So imagine just as a, you know, a theorist's uh, hardware architecture that you had a two or maybe three dimensional grid of harmonic oscillators connected by beam splitters 
which unlike optical beam splitters, they're, they're microwave activated using three or four wave mixing. You can turn them on and off and you can adjust their rate and their phase to, to move photons from one box to the other. And each box has a single qubit dispersively coupled to it. And um, let's compare that to a, an ion trap. We're gonna, we're gonna have gates that are similar to ion traps, spin dependent forces. But in an ion trap, each of the spins is coupled to all of the modes. And they like to advertise this gives them all to all coupling. Uh, but it's complicated and you have to, you can get crosstalk and there are various uh, complications, uh, although, you know, still works extremely well. And there, but there's no uh, controlled coupling between these modes, whereas here you can be talking to a single mode very cleanly with no crosstalk and then swap that mode through here to somewhere else and have it talk to another qubit and come back so that you can communicate and entangle the qubits or the uh, cavities. So uh, there are sort of three possible abstract machine models that this hardware could present to the software. It could be qubit-centric with the uh, bosons just playing the role of a communication bus that's highly controllable. You could have swapping going this way and swapping going that way at the same time as long as you schedule the swaps to avoid collisions. It could be bosonic mode centric where the only purpose of the qubits is to give you universal control over the oscillators which in turn contain perhaps quantum error correction bosonic codes. And um, it could be hybrid, in which you have access at the, at the software level to both the discrete variable and continuous variable degrees of freedom. That could be very good for quantum simulators for spins or fermions coupled to bosons, such as um, lattice gauge theories, which is one of the things that we're working on in, in C2QA. And uh, some particular version of this at, at uh, uh, in the dual rail encoding you'll hear about on Friday. So uh, in order to uh, produce, to program this thing, you have to produce unitaries. That's what quantum computers do. And um, so, so here's a short crash course in uh, control theory for these hybrid systems. So by, by driving a two-level system with classical drives, can you control it? Well, in some rotating wave approximation, you get control of the Pauli X and the Pauli Y operators. And there's a fundamental theorem from control theory that if the Lie algebra of the available controls, defined by their commutator, uh, spans the space of all operators, you're, you have uh, controllability. And uh, uh, fortunately, the commutator of the Pauli X and Y gives Pauli Z, and therefore you have uh, able to generate arbitrary SU2 Lie group rotations on this single qubit using only two classical controls. The same is not true for a, a harmonic oscillator. Your two classical drives, cosine and sine, couple you to, in the, some rotating frame to uh, position and momentum, and unfortunately the commutator of those guys is just uh, a number, and therefore the algebra closes and you cannot do anything other than displace the oscillator in phase space. You can make um, coherent states, but you can't make Fox states or GKP states or binomial code words. And, um, we know also physically that's closely related to the fact that the level spacing is uniform. But in this dispersive uh, coupling Hamiltonian where you have the qubit coupled to the cavity and their frequencies are different, then you get this dispersive coupling. And by applying drives to the cavity and the qubit, you can uh, reduce this nonlinearity to something slightly less nonlinear to just uh, x and p times one of the Pauli matrices. Uh, so if you look at the, the commutator algebra for that, that set of controls, for example, x, uh, the oscillator position times Pauli x, momentum times Pauli y, you get something interesting because the Pauli matrices anti-commute, you get conditional squeezing Hamiltonian. 
it will squeeze the position if z is plus one and, anti -sque and squeeze the momentum if z is minus one. If you take further commutators, you see that the polynomial grows and grows in degree, and the oper operator algebra does not close, and you get universal control. So then there's, knowing that, there are standard tricks, Trotter, Suzuki, to add control terms, and Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff, to multiply them in the form of commutators. And you can then generate the most general Hamiltonian that a single qubit coupled to a single oscillator can have, namely some polynomial of x and p for the oscillator and a vector of three polynomials dotted into the Pali system. And that gives you uh, universal control. So there are many uh, uh, instruction sets that we consider in this paper, but I'll stick to one example here, which is the control displacement, which is generated exponentials of that control set, and uh, plus single qubit rotations around axes on the, on the um, equator of the block sphere. And by alternating these, you're doing a kind of quantum signal processing uh, extended to um, uh, this, uh, where, the, where the rotation angles on the qubit are now quantum objects themselves that don't necessarily commute the position and momentum of the oscillator. And so here are some examples from uh, Alec Eichbusch's paper in the, from the Deveray group. Uh, this is the characteristic function for what is obviously a highly squeezed state. Here is the same for the binomial code words. This is all data. And this is the GKP code words. And these can be made in very shallow circuits. This is a very expressive gate set in the machine learning language. Um, so what can we do with these? Well, uh, the first thing is you can do the world's most complicated single qubit rotation uh, by um, uh, uh, doing a series of uh, controlled and uncontrolled displacements in such a way by applying these spin-dependent forces to the oscillator, if the qubit is in one, you make a counterclockwise circuit in phase space and pick up one Berry phase, and if qubit is zero, you pick up the opposite, and the net effect of that is no matter what was in the cavity before, it's the same, unchanged, but the qubit gets a phase kickback which rotates it around the z-axis, and here you can see the Ramsey fringe oscillations measuring that uh, rotation. So can we uh, extend that to do something interesting within this qubit-centric abstract machine model where the cavities do something to the qubit, not the other way around? And uh, Kevin Smith has uh, developed a uh, series of entangling gates, so the RZZ theta, this two-qubit rotation, you can achieve, let's say, between this qubit and that qubit by doing a control displacement in the first cavity, then moving the contents of that cavity down here, doing a different control displacement with that guy, moving it back and forth a couple of times, and uh, you can get one of four trajectories depending on the four values of Z1 and Z2. And if Z1 and Z2 are the same, uh, you make a, a clockwise loop, either here or here, depending on whether it's 0, 0, or 1, 1. And if they're the opposite, you go counterclockwise, either here or here, picking up opposite phase and therefore doing this gate. Now, you can, there are simple, you could uh, have bigger swap networks so that you entangle this qubit with that qubit by swapping uh, through some path this way. And unlike Molmer Sorensen and ion traps, you don't do this to everybody. You select who you do this to. And you can do several of them in parallel. Uh, Kevin's also found similar circuits that will produce C naught, ZZZ of theta, TOF three qubit, Toffoli gates, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, so that's a nice example of using the cavities as communication bus plus things that uh, can entangle uh, the qubits in a qubit-centric model. In a boson-centric model, we want to use the same gate set 
to uh, do things to the oscillators using the qubits with the same gate set. And one example is um, uh, an improved circuit for GKP bosonic code stabilization uh, and gates. And uh, this is what was used in the first part of this is what was used in the recent uh, experiment from uh, Michelle's group. So I'll just remind you that the idealized GKP wave functions are, are a picket fence evenly spaced in position, and its Fourier transform is a picket fence easily, even, evenly spaced in momentum. And these are defined by stabilizers, two stabilizers, which are a momentum boost and a position displacement. You can see, understand the displace, you know, if you displace this by a lattice constant, it comes back to itself. So it's a plus one eigenstate of that. And um, so the stabilizers in the code uh, are translations in phase space. How do we measure the eigenvalue of those stabilizers? Well, unlike the Pali stabilizers you're used to, they're not plus one or minus one. They have a phase that lives on the unit circle. And they're sensitive, that phase is sensitive to small displacement errors of this uh, lattice of states. And the way you measure the eigenvalue associated with that unitary is with uh, a phase kickback circuit like this, um, much as was used um, uh, to, uh, in that Ramsey fringe experiment I showed you. So, so uh, you can reinterpret this momentum boost when you put a z there, instead of a momentum boost that depends on whether z is plus one or minus one, you can think of it as a rotation of the qubit around the z-axis that depends on the position of the oscillator. And if the positions are on a lattice and they're in the right place, that rotation is a multiple of two pi and doesn't give you any change in the state of the qubit. But if there's an error, you pick up some signal. Well, that's fine for the ideal world, but in practice, uh, you have to have a Gaussian envelope and finite squeezing of these picket fences. And so there's some quantum uncertainty in the rotation angle of the qubit. And it's not always exactly 2 pi, e, a multiple of 2 pi, even when there's no actual error because of this quantum uncertainty. So that's a problem. And, um, and also, you know, we have to, uh, deal with this fact that there's an overall Gaussian envelope. So how do we handle this? And uh, it's too complicated to explain now, but there's a, a wonderful uh, autonomous protocol. Rather than measuring the small shifts, you run this circuit uh, developed uh, by these folks, uh, where you have the, the stabilizer in there, uh, in a, with a, but with a controlled gate, as I showed you. And then you pre and post pen that with very small um, perpendicular displacements in phase space, which actually turn out, if you choose them correctly, to cancel out the effect of these Gaussian fluctuations in position. And then rather than measuring and feedback, you just uh, reset the qubit uh, or measure and, and reset it. Um, uh, and it pumps away the entropy um, uh, from the system without having to do direct feedback. Um, so that's, uh, that, that was an interesting step forward. Now, if you want to have the GKP code, and the, it's interesting fact that the Pauli unitaries, like uh, the X, Y, or Z unitaries, are just displacements. They're very easy to do, whether you just send a classical pulse and change the position of the oscillator. But how in the world could we do a Pali rotation, let's say, around the x-axis, which is a superposition of not doing a displacement and doing a displacement? Those are sort of macroscopically distinguishable things. How do you do that? And it turns out uh, Shraddha Singh, uh, has, uh, who's working with me and uh, Shruti Puri, uh, has modified this small, big, small uh, stabilization protocol that does autonomously does the error correction. It just splits this middle step into two pieces and inserts a qubit rotation in between. So it, it actually takes almost exactly the same length of time as the stabilization process, and the stabilization keeps working. 
And so it protects against photon loss in the cavity or small phase-based displacements. And it also has some favorable properties with respect to the ancilla dephasing errors. And this looks a little bit like ordinary gate teleportation, but actually it's not because this second half of the circuit is not the inverse of the first half. And uh, so that's a, uh, something that's being written up now. Uh, so uh, there are many open questions. Uh, how do you do, what's the analog of randomized benchmarking for continuous variable systems? The, there are analogs between Gaussian operations and Clifford operations on qubits, but the Gaussian operations are non-compact. They involve Boliubov transformations, not uh, uh, SU2. They don't form a two design for the theorists. Uh, do, I, do we have, we learning how to do this non-abelian quantum signal processing using both momentum boosts and position displacements as rotation angles on the qubits, but is there a formal theory to give us convergence bounds on how well that works? And is there a nice way to construct uh, useful unitaries other than numerical optimization? And we've made some progress on that, but still lots more work needs to be done. Uh, so uh, this is a very <laughs> incomplete history. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to the many, many people, all of whom I, I can't uh, uh, list here. Uh, that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, recently inside YQI from postdocs, students, uh, undergrads, and even a high school student. And uh, many thanks to my uh, faculty colleagues uh, with whom I'm working and to uh, a few more that we're excited to be recruiting right now. And finally, uh, it happens that this month is a um, palindromic birthday for Rob when expressed in binary. <laughs> and so I want to wish Rob a happy birthday and thank him for so many years of just fantastic collaboration. <laughs>